Yuri, welcome to the Visionary Life podcast. I was just uh, telling you before we hit record that back in the day when I studied at CSNN about 10 years ago, I guess, I vividly remember encountering either a podcast of yours or a blog and diving deep into your health-related content. And so fast forward many years later to see an email from your team in my inbox to interview you is really cool and almost like a full circle moment. I was like, what has this guy been up to since I last encountered his content? So thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. So I want to go back to kind of the beginning of your health and wellness journey. I know at one point you were a pro athlete, you had a bit of a health crisis. Can you kind of take us back to that moment and what brought you into the health and wellness space originally? Yeah. So growing up, I was very active and at 10, I decided I wanted to become a professional soccer player. That was, you know, some, some dream I had. And I was like, I'm going to make it happen. So I spent the next decade training and playing and, you know, trying to get to that level. And eventually in my early twenties, I did, which was uh, amazing. But during that process, I didn't recognize how unhealthy I was. I was tired all the time, sleeping 12 hours a day, falling asleep after school, stuff like that. I didn't think anything of it. I thought I was just, you know, training a lot. That's why. And then when I was 17, I lost all of my hair to an autoimmune condition in the space of six weeks. And that was a big wake up call because I was like, whoa, my dad's Moroccan. So I had a lot of hair to begin with. And then, it, you know, just kind of look, looks like, like it does now, but it was a, a real wake up call because I had no clue why it happened. And it really prompted the question about, all right, well, why did this happen? Then I started, my mom, I should say, was, was proactive in helping me go to different practitioners, you know, TCMs, naturopaths, et cetera, mm-hmm. did a bunch of different stuff. Nothing really like had a lasting impact. So I kind of just like let it go for a while. And then I went to the University of Toronto, did my kinesiology degree there, uh, went back to school at the CSNN to learn holistic nutrition, because even though I went to U of T and went through all that, I was like still clueless when it came to nutrition. And then my, I remember my first day at the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition, I was like, sorry, what? How have I not known this? And I was like, this is day one. What is the next year going to look like? And it tr- like fundamentally transformed everything for me. And I started to like apply everything I was learning about. Like really, like I would learn something in school and I'd go home and that was like the thing I was doing. So I was, uh, I would say my first real forte into health because of all that stuff was really like going high alkaline, raw plant-based and it changed my life. Like I, I had more energy than I ever had in my life. I regrew my hair in the space of about six weeks. Although about a decade later, I got a tetanus booster and my hair fell out again, but we'll save that for another day. But it was, it was like just such a transformational experience for myself that I was like, I have to share this with other people. Cause I'm like, I didn't know this. And I went to school, like one of the top universities in the world for kinesiology and health sciences. I played pro soccer and like, I still had no clue. And so that really prompted me to want to share the message of nutrition and health. I had been working as a personal trainer while I was going through school as well. So I thought this would be great for my clients to know about because I could help them with their nutrition. And that's kind of how it all started. That's, um, you know, initially wanting to help myself. And then obviously as a byproduct, recognizing that I could help others. And I really enjoyed working with clients. Um, Eventually I got to a point where I was a little bit burnt out after doing it for seven years and 12 to 14 hours a day. And I still wanted to help a lot of people. And that's 2005, 2006. I started my first business online, you know, went through a number of years of struggle and and poverty line income. And then eventually, you know, got some guidance and mentorship in 2010. That made a big difference. Then from that point, you know, we grew uh, pretty substantially, sold the company a couple of years ago, and then started Healthpreneur in 2016, because a lot of other health professionals were asking me for business advice because they saw what I was doing. And I was like, this seems like there's a big opportunity in the market. Like there's a lot of health, health professionals who are amazing at what they do. They want to help all these people, but they just don't know how to bridge the gap. They don't know how to reach them because marketing and sales and business is not something we're taught in school. Mm -hmm. And that's where Healthpreneur was born out of. And that's, you know, what I do today is help health professionals build better businesses online. And our goal is to help a billion people to better health. And we feel we can do that by helping our clients, the business owners build better businesses that ultimately impact more people. So yeah, it's, um, that's the journey in a nutshell, but it's, uh, it's been fun. 
Mm. And it's only starting. Wow. Okay. So much to unpack there. You really accelerated through that. So let's go back first. (laughs) First off, I want to say like, I had the exact same epiphany when I sat down in nutrition school for the first time. And like the information that I thought, holy crap, if this is what I've learned in the first month, like I just Mm -hmm. can't wait uh, to learn the rest of the content inside of school. And even at the end of the program, I remember thinking to myself, even if I never make a dollar from this program, or if I never um, do anything with this diploma, this is still the most valuable information that everybody needs to know. So I think it's, you know, just one of those investments that whether personally or professionally, just incredible to equip yourself with that kind of toolkit. Um, Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I think the next question that I have for you is like, I know sitting in school about to graduate, it is so overwhelming thinking like, what type of career path am I going to, you know, uh, embark on after school? And like, what am I going to do with this diploma? Did you know immediately upon graduating, like how you wanted to help people? How did you kind of package up what you learned in nutrition school and actually start to sell it? Yeah. So I think part of it was when I was at U of T, I actually wanted to become a sport med doctor. So my goal was play pro soccer and then become a sport medicine doctor for a pro soccer team. That was my goal. And then after my first year at U of T, I was like, I never want to go into medicine. So that was <laughs> pretty, pretty simple. But I was also not like most of my, most of my classmates went into Cairo physio teaching. I was the only person who kind of did his own thing. So I was training clients while I was at U of T. When I graduated, I actually went to France to play soccer. And then I came back to go back to school at the CSN. So mm-hmm. I knew I wanted to help people. At the time, I just thought it was going to be like working one-on-one with clients. And I thought the nutrition side was like, I'm in class and I'm literally like, oh yeah, this could totally apply to Atlanta or whoever. And I'm thinking about my clients. So I had that, that combination of practical real world experience. Mm-hmm. And I was learning at the same time, which I thought for me, which I thought was very valuable. So that's kind of how I blended the two, but I also wrote my first book in the back of class at CSNN. Interesting. Because, yeah, like I, I'm a very high quick start on the Colby, you know, personality test, if anyone knows what that is. Yeah. So I'm sitting in the back of the class and I'm like, you know, listening and whatever, but I'm also writing my book. Like I'm writing my first book called Eating for Energy. And because it was literally like the stuff I was applying into my life. And I knew that like I had to get this out in a big way. Mm-hmm. I've always, I've always been one to believe that, you know, whatever I set my mind to is going to happen. Like there was never any doubt. I, I, was, I mean, there's doubt obviously, but like I had yeah. a, a high level of self-belief, we put it that way. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of how, you know, I started to apply, you know, what I was learning is, is a little bit of the taking what I was learning, applying with my clients, but at the same time, thinking long-term down the road, how do I productize this knowledge? How do I take what I know how to do now? and leverage it because around that time I was starting to feel like I was starting to feel the squeeze of waking up at six in the morning, seeing clients at seven, mm-hmm. all the way till seven o'clock at night. Like it was starting to, it was starting to really tax me. And I was like, I, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And so initially I thought it was going to be through information like books and so forth. Mm-hmm. So that eating for energy book was actually the first ebook that I created when I started my online business. It didn't really gain much traction for the first couple of years. Cause I had no clue what I was doing. But eventually, uh, that actually became the book that we later kind of evolved and transformed into my number two New York Times bestseller, The All the Energy Diet. So Mm -hmm. like, it's just so cool how everything, you know, kind of did its thing. But I I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, everyone has their own journey. Everyone has their own path. I remember, you know, many of our our classmates at the CSNN, some of them were in a position where they were working at like a health food store and they just wanted more knowledge to be able to give better advice to the patrons coming in. Mm-hmm. Other people knew they wanted to start their own nutrition practice. Others, you know, so there's a little bit of a little bit of everything. And I really think clarity is, you know, like, you know, clarity of vision is very important, which is fitting based on the name of this podcast. Mm-hmm. But it, it's sometimes it's tough to know what the I think, like, especially now, like because of because of technology and, and, and the world changing so rapidly. Like you might set a vision five years down the road that's obsolete by the time you get there. So yeah. I think it's like, you have to really check in. I knew at my core that I, I want to help people. I want to contribute value, 
And I feel the most alive when I do that. Like if I go on a vacation and hang out on the beach for more than a day, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, I got to add some value. I got to help someone. And that's just the way I am. Right. And I, and I think for me to, 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 to recognize that early on and, and realize I'm like, I don't know what this exactly is going to look like, but I know I need to share this. And I just want to, you know, mm-hmm. put stuff out there, even if it's not perfectly structured and mapped out yet. Yeah. So it's kind of like taking that imperfect action and, and eventually, you know, things started to unfold and, mm-hmm. and crystallize. So that was my path. That was my journey. So true. And like, oftentimes the clarity of vision comes through action. Right. And if so, if yeah. you never take the action to get started, uh, you're never going to see the next step or you're never going to see where you could possibly go. So I love that you have that character trait. I think a lot of entrepreneurs do of just get started, like just dive in and learn as you go. And especially because you were kind of an early adopter in the online business space, right? So I'm sure there wasn't as many resources and coaches helping people to build in the online space. Like you probably had to kind of just learn as you dove deep into that space and kind of figure it out along the way. Yeah. And I was, I was also pretty stupid to be honest, because I thought, <laughs> Hey, I'm, I'm a smart guy. I can figure this out. Cause I've yeah. apparently done this before, which I hadn't. Yeah. So I spent three years in that kind of stubborn, rugged individualist mindset of like, Oh, I'll, I'll build a great business. I'm like, dude, you've never done this before. Yeah. What makes you think you can? Mm-hmm. And that was a really hard lesson I had to learn was like, I mean, my first year online, I made $6,000, you know, living in Toronto, <laughs> you know, that's not going to get you very far. Mm -hmm. And I was still working with clients at the time, but then I said, you know what, in year two, I need to put more time into this. So I'm going to cut all of my clients. And I literally cut like 75% of my clients. So my in-person income, which was pretty low to begin with, was cut dramatically. And then my second year and my third year online, were not much better than my first. So, so at the end of 2009, I remember I went to Starbucks and I was kind of thinking about the next year. And I said, dude, what, like, what, what makes you think the next year is going to be better than this one or the one before or the one before, if you keep doing the same thing. And I just said like, what do I have to start doing to get different results? And I realized the one thing I, well, the two things I needed to do were number one, start going to some live events where I could actually meet some others, other people learn, et cetera, and then hire a coach. I didn't know who that coach was going to be or anything, but I just knew that that's what I needed to do. And I remember as soon as I made that commitment, uh, things started to unfold. Like I, you know, I heard about this one online event, this other events in person, obviously. Mm-hmm. And I, I just threw them on my credit card. I was like, I don't have the money to, to pay for this, you know, $2,000 ticket, but I'm going to go right. Pay for the hotel, pay for the airfare. Mm-hmm. And it was like the single best decision I made at the time. Like, I'm like, it's, it, I knew it was going to pay itself off. One of those events I heard a speaker, he eventually became my coach. I literally went up to him and I said, Hey, do you, you know, what's your mastermind about? I need to join. And again, like it was more money to join that than I made in the previous year, <laughs> but I knew I needed to do it. Like, I was like, I still remember the feeling in my stomach. And I'm like, you know, when you, when you pay, you pay attention. And I knew I needed the strategy, the resources, um, in terms of like, not necessarily the money, but the, the tools and different things that I didn't have access to. Mm-hmm. And then obviously the people, like I met. In that, just in that, like in 2010, in that one mastermind, I met some of my, to this day, best friends. And over the next 10, 11 years, you know, the business, just the business part of it alone that we generated together was just, you know, incredible. And then obviously the relationships. So, yeah, I mean, it's, um, there's, the thing is like, there's no barrier to entry to building a business online, which is dangerous. Yeah. Because if you have a clinic you know, it's five, 10, 15, 20,000 bucks a month in lease, whatever. That's a major barrier for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I think it's ridiculous to be honest, especially if you're not like a hands-on practitioner, there's no reason to even have a facility like that. But the very fact that anyone can start a business online, I would even question the notion of business or is just like, or is this like a hobby yeah. that I'm just going to post on Instagram and TikTok and see what happens. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there's, what I've noticed is a lot of health professionals, a lot of health experts who are online, but, you know, we've spoken with tens of thousands of them that have not become clients over the past seven years. And a lot of it is like, you know, they think they're doing well, like that's what, you know, it looks like, but they're making a thousand bucks a month. Right. Like, 
what are you gonna do about that? Like, you're just gonna keep posting these like videos on TikTok and stuff. Like, yep. so I, I think like really approaching the business and I, like, you know, giving my older, like my former younger self advice is approach the business as if this were a brick and mortar practice you were setting up, you know, like build it as a business. Um, it's funny because sometimes we'll have people who have like a super successful practice, huge overhead. And then we recommend using things like ClickFunnels for like 97 bucks a month. We're like, oh, yeah, I don't know if I want to invest in that. Like, really? All right. Have fun at the clinic, right? Or, you know, think about this differently. So it's just fun to see the difference in like mindset when people come online. Mm-hmm. And the mistake that I made in 2000 or the dream that I was following back in 2006 was the laptop lifestyle. I'm going to yeah. write an ebook, put it up online. People are going to buy it and I'm just going to chill. Because at that point, I was so sick and tired of working with people. Like I was just burnt out. I'm like, I don't want to talk with anyone. I want to write an ebook and I just want to chill. Yeah. And that did not happen. And I can't stress that enough that that does not happen online. It's, it's, I say it's infinitely harder to build an online business than brick and mortar mm-hmm. because of obscurity. Like no one's going to come across your website. People mm-hmm. can walk down the street and see your clinic, but in online, it doesn't happen like that. So I had to very quickly, I mean, when I say very quickly after three years, learn fundamental skills around messaging, marketing, you know, et cetera, to stand out and, you know, get in front of the right people. And mm-hmm. that's a skill that everyone has to learn. Like if they want to succeed, especially in today's day and age online, like it's, it's fundamental and it's sad that it's not taught in school. Right. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Um, like going back to your days, you said in your first year of online business, you made something like $6,000, right? Yep. Fast forward to today, you have a successful business in the online space. What is like one of the most fundamental differences that when you look at the Yuri that was making 6,000 a year to the Yuri today, like what is one tool or mindset tactic that you acquired since then that you feel like has been profound in making that shift in revenue? The most important skills communication. So I think I've always been a good communicator, but the key distinction is learning how to persuade people in a way that's obviously beneficial for them, right? And doing yep. so in the form of writing and speaking. So mm. either speaking like in this type of platform or from stage, specifically on the phone, if we're in a coaching type of business, learning how to sell, learning how to sell yourself, learning how to sell your ideas. And mm-hmm. there's a lot, of, a lot of hangups that health professionals have around this. But the way I see this is like, every piece of content I create is me selling an idea. So mm. if you love sharing content, you love selling. You just have to reframe it, right? So I think the, the one skill we teach our clients um, how to acquire clients and how to deliver to them without one-on-one necessarily. And I tell them, and I actually just had a call from this morning to remind them about this. I said, the one thing, if you guys do this two things every single day for the next 365 days, you will write your own lottery ticket. One is write an ad every single day. Not that you have to launch an ad every single day, mm-hmm. but learn how to write copy that moves people to action. And then that can be repurposed as an email, social post, whatever. And the second thing is spend 20 to 30 minutes working on your selling skills, role play, learn how to sell, like, you know, listen to your calls, evaluate, get better. Between the two of those, that's one hour a day, fundamental skill development, because most people have to understand that like the base of the pyramid in terms of like business growth, sales and marketing is the foundation. If you do not know how to do that, you can't outsource that and expect miracles. You have to learn fundamentally how to generate demand Mm -hmm. and how to enroll clients or enroll, you know, new business down the road. You can certainly hire people on your team to take care of that. But, you know, I believe every single leader in the health space, most of them, most of us want to, spread the message, speak on stage, help, you know, share our content. Mm -hmm. All of that is selling. It's all marketing and it's all selling. If you like being on podcasts like this, this is marketing, right? Yeah. And you have to get good with it. You have to get good at that. So I think the skill, but the most important skill really is, is communication in the forms of written communication, verbal communication, and understanding how to move people to their bigger future. And I think that's, you know, what I was focused on back in the day was not skill development. It was chasing the latest tactic. 
oh, like I got to do like, I'm going to blog this way to do this and this, and then and this came up and then this thing, this thing. It's not about the tactics. Like everyone's looking for the latest tactical band-aid to fix strategic problems. Mm-hmm. Right? And most people are not even at a level where strategy is even an issue. It's just, they don't have the fundamental skills that are needed to quote unquote, pay the bills. Right. So sales and marketing build that skill. And there's obviously sub skills in there. That's the first most important thing that every business owner needs to, to develop. And that's what I wish I had done earlier on. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. It's so important too. And I think that where a lot of health and wellness practitioners get caught up is that they're, they're so gifted at what they do. Right. And they have such a passion and a heart to serve, but they forget that in order to do their work, they have to become better at the sales and marketing, right? Because you can't just live in your passion and expect that the mechanics of your business are going to work themselves out magically. It's like, you know, especially in those early days, you need to be equally focused on serving clients and sharing your gift, but also figuring out like, how am I going to keep the lights on in this business? And a lot of that is going to come down to, are you willing to invest in learning a set of skills that maybe you've never had to learn before? And I think, you know, one of the things that you mentioned that really jumped out at me is getting yourself to an in-person event or, you know, in times of COVID, like if it has to be online, sure. But there is something so powerful that happens when you commit to getting on a plane or driving somewhere and getting out of your current environment and deciding and and being in a room full of people who are also trying to learn and grow and relationship build. And there is just something that I feel like has happened every time I've returned from a conference or an event or any type of like mastermind experience, like there is a massive period of growth afterwards and I'm recommitted to my own development. So I feel like that's such a a good tip that you shared to, yeah. Like if you want to be more creative and more successful, get to a creative and successful place and like just immerse yourself and you will learn by osmosis through those people in the room, you know, just like learning another language. You're better off living in the country for six months than taking an hour a week, you know, at some, at some course locally, mm-hmm. yeah, like proximity is power. It's everything. We, we become our environments. Like if I wanted to become a better soccer player, yeah, I got to play with players that are at a higher level. Like if I play with my kids all day and I'm not going to get better. Mm-hmm. And I think part of it is, well, like, I don't have the money yet to invest. And like someone the other day was just like, Hey, like, I really want to go South by Southwest, but I'm like, you know, the tickets a little bit much. I'm like, dude, put the frigging thing on your credit card and go. Yeah. Right. Because when you like, whatever the price is, whether it's a couple hundred bucks, a couple thousand bucks, value is an extraction game. So if you, if you put the money down, you're like, I'm going, you're not just going to waste that time. You're going to find a way to make it as valuable for you as possible. You'll contribute, you'll connect you'll say, man, I, I paid X number of dollars for this. I don't want this to go to waste, but it's, it's so important because I think we're all one relationship away from any breakthrough we want in our business. Mm. I was, uh, you know, just like a real quick uh, anecdote on this with my book. So I was the, the second mastermind I joined, uh, this 2011, 2012, I was at an event for the mastermind and I met a guy in the room who I had known about, but never really connected with, right? Because obviously online, it's, it's different than if you have lunch with them, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we connected and we're like, hey, we should, we should like just do some stuff together. Like, you know, he had a similar audience as mine where we did some cross promotion stuff. We became one of their top um, joint venture partners. And then I was invited to one of their masterminds that year. So at that mastermind, I was in a room and I met two people. One later became a great friend. He actually became one of our top partners, actually the number one partner Mm -hmm. for my book launch uh, when we hit number two on the New York Times list. But the other person in the room was Reed Tracy, the CEO of Hay House, Mm. who like, you don't just get to like call up the CEO of a publishing company, right? So I'm sitting in the room with him and we're connecting. And I was like, I have an idea for a book. And I just pitched them really quickly. And he's like, let's talk on Wednesday. And by Friday, I had a book proposal. And that never would have happened. So that book then became the number two New York Times bestseller that it was. 
that led to another huge two book deal with Rodale afterwards, mm-hmm. Dr. Oz, the doctors, all like all the circus act, right? But none of that stuff would have happened without the relationships in the process. So if I had continued to sit behind my laptop and think I could do this by myself, that was never going to happen. So I want everyone to really think about, like if you're, if you're thinking of joining a coaching program or a mastermind or going to an event, don't exclusively think about what the ROI is about like what strategy or content am I going to get out of this? Mm -hmm. Think of it as a lateral ROI. Like who could I potentially, you you don't even know who is in there. You don't even know what relationship or a couple relationships could become your wedding party in five or 10 years or your best business partners down the road, or they Mm -hmm. might know someone who introduces you to someone. I have relationships now that I'm like, I don't even remember how we met. Yeah. Right. But it was from someone, from someone, from doing this thing, from doing that thing. And you can't create that type of that effect if you don't put yourself in those environments. So it's, it's not like a, it's, it's a no brainer. Like, I don't care if you don't have the money, put in your credit card, mm-hmm. just do it. You'll find a way to make it work. It is, it, it has, like, it's so fundamentally important for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think like for some reason over the last five, 10 years, and you've already said the term in this podcast, people like they dream of this laptop lifestyle in which they assume they never have to leave the four walls of their office and that they can just hide behind the screen. And that doesn't involve needing to connect with people. And it's like, no, like that is not the way to build a business. Like you need to be getting out of your house more than the average person, because you still have to meet people. You still have to connect. You still have to, you know, build those strategic partnerships and relationships and meet your industry peers. So I hate that vision of like, yeah, you can just sit in the hammock on your laptop and just like build this thing alone. And I think that's gotta be like a very common misconception because it doesn't really work that way, at least not in my experience. And it sounds like not from your experience either. It's gonna be in those key relationships where you yeah. see that massive upswing in growth that doesn't happen just by hiding inside of your home week after week after week. Yeah. And like, I know um, at least a dozen people in my my time so far that are very like I would say I'm I'm increasingly more so introverted now than I was 10 years ago yep I'm totally happy and not talking to anyone for a while but I also mm-hmm. know that I get energized when I'm with people temporarily yeah but I have you know at least a dozen friends that are you know engineers by trade very analytical people very very much like I don't need to talk to anyone. And they figured out how to build massive businesses online behind their computer, but it was not like client facing. It was yeah. here's some information, selling it directly from a web page. They learned that whole world. And that's totally doable, you know, but you have to understand like that's that's a very different path and it requires a very different level of individual. Like if you're someone who thrives off people, which most of us do, Mm -hmm. uh, that's tough to make work. But even in those cases, like, you know, most of them are still very, very personable and they want, they do things that look to connect. Like as an example, one of my friends who was probably one of the first eight figure business owners in the online fitness space, he had an ebook that just killed it. And this guy is an engineer by backgrounds and uh, one of the kind of the early adopters of, of, you know, like the whole ebook stuff online did very, very well. Mm -hmm. But he also realized like, although he is very kind of introverted and more to himself, he had an idea a number of years ago to buy a house in Utah where he lived. And it was like a house that he could then bring all of his colleagues and business friends together. So we would have like these three, four or five times a year meetups at this house in Utah that he bought and that we just, you know, paid a little bit to cover some expenses and some food while we were there. But for him, that was so important because he realized like he really valued the connection, yeah. but just in a different way. So I don't care if you're a hermit or you're someone who's more social, like none of us are going to thrive mm-hmm. with our laptops by ourselves. Right. So mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely an important truth to drop to anyone listening. I know something else that kind of fires you up is this concept that there isn't really such thing as a passive income. 
uh, I've heard you speak about this before on another podcast. So I'm curious, can you kind of crack open that topic? Uh, what are your thoughts on passive income and yeah. kind of, uh, yeah, just like give us your current take on what it is. <laughs> so passive income is what I thought I was going to create when I came online, like write an ebook, put it up on a website. And apparently a lot of people are going to see that and I could just chill. That never happens. So I would say today, I mean, I have, I would say significantly more passive income than I did 10 years ago, but it took me all this time to build the machine to create that. So for me, when I say passive income, it's not like there's different definitions of what passive is, but I think number one, you have to create active income in order to generate passive income. So for instance, if you have a business that's profitable, you take the money out if you want, you invest in whatever you want to invest in, you know, that could be more or less passive, but that's a secondary vehicle outside of your business that, you know, you have to get your business to a point where you have the profit to be able to even consider that. But in your business, like you can still generate passive income, but it's not going to happen on day one. Like I would say right now, you know, I don't do any of my enrollment calls anymore. We have a, a sales team that does that internally, but it took me time to master that skill set, build the team, elevate someone to director of sales, continue to lead, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the cool thing is, you know, like they'll enroll people that I have zero, like I have zero part in that process. So is that passive income? Maybe, but it took you, I mean, you have to build the machine in order for that to even happen. Mm -hmm. So I think passive income is way too celebrated. I think what we want is predictable income. Hmm as opposed to passive, right? Passive, like if you think of investing, let's just use the stock market as an example, you can have passive income in the stock market if, if you just put money in it and it does its thing, but you can have passive income that like goes into the, into the toilet bowl if the stocks don't perform well. Yeah, I think most of us want predictable income and predictable income comes from having some type of system, AKA machine, being your business that produces results independently of you having to be involved in every step of the process. That's what I'm, that's what I've always been fascinated by is like, how do I build a machine mm -hmm. that I can step out of to whatever degree I want to, that still provides tremendous value to my clients that still helps us add value to the marketplace. And that provides me with the, you know, the financial means to, to do what I want, where I want, whatever. That for me is more important. And the realization that I love working, like I friggin' love working. Yeah. So why would I want anything? Like I'm not looking for passive income, right? And if, mm -hmm. I think one of the traits that we've noticed in a lot of our successful clients and typically the people that we attract is we're not looking for people who are looking for passive income. We're looking for people who really, really enjoy the work they do that they don't want to ret retire from. Yeah, that they have a big vision for serving others. And I think if you're a health professional, like we're all here to serve other people. Like I can't imagine not doing that, you know? Yeah. And, I, and I don't think we'd be very happy by retiring, you know, for more than a couple of days. And then it's like, well, I got to like, you know, add some value somewhere. So yeah, I think passive income is just misunderstood. It's, you know, it's obviously way overplayed, I think in the digital space. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tricky too, because you see so many ads nowadays about all sorts of different business models, you know, fulfill like FBA, Amazon type of business, you know, crypto, blockchain, yeah. there's all sorts of stuff we could be doing, right? But I think the best way to build quote unquote passive income is build a great business that generates cash flow for you, the owner, that you can keep in the business, take out of the business, invest, do whatever you want. But even in the business, like you don't need to sell it because it generates cash flow in such a way that it provides the financial means to do whatever you want. So, and if you love what you do, then it's not really work. Absolutely. So that's, that's my take on it. Yeah. And I love that distinction between passive income and predictable income. Like I think most of our listeners, they just want predictably higher income rather exactly. than just like a low passive income. It's just like, just let it come in, but it's just pennies. It's like, no, we deserve to make a lot of money. Obviously there's going to be, you know, work required, but predictably higher is maybe more what people mean when they say passive. So yeah. I think it's just an interesting differentiator. So today you run healthpreneur, and this is where you help health and fitness professionals who want to scale their coaching business online 
faster without the grind. You've hit on all the best buzzwords there. So now we are super intrigued. So um, what, like, what are, what's the general situation or circumstance that somebody comes to you with? when they need to invest in your services? Like what's going on in somebody's business yep. when they reach out to healthpreneur? So we have two avatars. Avatar number one is the clinician. So the person who has their own clinic or works in a clinic who even before lockdowns was just burnt out and understands that the, what I call the medical matrix is the worst business model ever because it's not a business model. It's a trade time for money for the rest of your life model. It's like a self-employed, like you've self-employed yourself yeah. full-time. Exactly. You and that's purchase, it. Yeah. Like you purchased the job, right? Like yeah. congratulations, here's your overhead. You have to pay a lease and it's just, it's insanity. And I've been, listen, like I love health professionals. That's why we serve them. Yeah. But I've also been a patient to many of them and I see how they run their businesses and I'm like, oh my God. Like I went to a naturopath about a year ago four patients in the clinic. He's also running front desk. He's like, give me a sec. I just got to check this person out. I'm like, that's chaos. Anyways. Yeah. It's just, and like he, he said he was taking a vacation for a week when we were working together. I'm like, when was the last vac vacation you took? He's like, I can't even remember. And that's, that's the sad reality. So our first avatar is that practitioner who's open-minded to recognize there could be a different way of serving people that doesn't involve their time and money, their time for money or their in-person work. So they're starting to see the writing on the wall. They're starting to recognize that virtual is, is the future. Like there's, there's always gonna be a time for hands-on therapy. I'm not, I'm not discounting that. But no one's saying, if you're a chiropractor or a massage therapist or, or a physical therapist, no one's saying that's the only way you can do things. Right. Because some of our most successful clients are chiros and PTs, hmm. osteopaths. You have to be open-minded enough to think about, well, it's not about getting paid for what I do. It's getting paid for what I know. And if you can learn how to like extract and articulate what you know in a way that helps people, all of a sudden, like the world is your oyster. So the first avatar is the practitioner who has been in clinic for many years. They're burnt out. They're, you know, they're seeing they've got a quote unquote full practice, which is nothing for me to be like amazed with because a full practice means you're burnt out. And it means you have yep. a, suffering, a suffering list of patients that are waiting for your help. Yes. That's, that's not ideal. So you step away from the practice, you don't get paid. You step away from the practice, your patients don't get helped. That's, that's not a sustainable business model. So those people who are in that situation and they start to see like, oh, 76% of people are now preferring digital healthcare, 38 fold increase in digital healthcare since 2020, $14.6 billion over the last year invested in digital care. This is the future. Like we are, uh, COVID's obviously like accelerated this whole thing big time, but yeah, you know, we've, we've been beating this drum about virtual practice for, you know, since 2016. <laughs> and it's just now what we recognized during COVID when, when March, April, March, 2020, well, every conversation we had was, I've been thinking about this. Now I have to do this. Yeah. And it was just the kick in the ass that people needed. So that's the first type of person that comes in. They're a little bit more. Uh, they're a little bit newer to the, the whole world of like online and marketing yes. and funnels and stuff. So there's yeah. a little bit more of a growth curve there. Uh, the second avatar, which is, I would say, probably our most, more, most successful in terms of results relative to time, is the health expert who has been online, but has been chasing every latest squirrel. So yeah. they do the challenges, the funnels, they're doing TikTok videos, Instagram videos, free challenges. Uh, they're writing a book that no one sees. Um, they're doing all this stuff and mm -hmm. our whole message is again, without the grind, which means we don't do any of that stuff. Now, the reason I can share that, and I'm so passionate about sharing that message is because my first business, you know, that we eventually built to, you know, great heights was built on all of that. So we did, you know, we did the content creation. Like I love content. I think content's amazing yep. as a back burner, long play. But if you need content to pay the bills today, it's never going to happen, mm -hmm. especially if you don't have a large platform. We had, so in my previous business, we built our blog to 1.4 million visitors per month. Wow. And people think like, oh, I'm just going to blog and people are going to find my stuff. Like when you get into the weeds of understanding how you do that, most people don't even realize how much traffic they're getting to the website, which in most cases is like a dozen people a month. 
right? Unless you really put a concerted effort, we had a payroll just on our blog, $35,000 a month for writers, editorial, like that was just on the blog, SEO, all that kind of stuff, writing three articles a day, 3,000 words each, infographics, all that stuff. It took us nearly 10 years to get there. So if you're an individual thinking you're going to post once a week and, it, and, and it's like spitting into the ocean, expecting that spit to create a tidal wave, yeah. like it's never going to happen. So that's one thing that we advise people not to do, because although there are great examples of people in the space, like my good friend, Josh Axe, who's done a great job with that. Like I understand his business. Like he was a former client way back in the day. Mm-hmm. And I understand what goes into that. Yep. Our YouTube channel, we built to 300,000 subscribers. And again, it took 10 years to get there. So like all of this stuff is, it's, it's listen, like in the long term, the more content you create, the better. Yeah. The challenge though, is you have to understand that there's two ways to build your business, free and paid. Free, when I say free, it's kind of what I've been talking about. The organic, just post on social, post on your blog, et cetera. Yeah. The reality though is that it's not free because successful people understand that um, time is expensive and money is cheap. Mm-hmm. And for the longest time, I had it the other way around. So I'm like, oh, it's free. I'm just going to put in 20 hours a day to make it work. Yeah. And then if I didn't, if I hadn't lost my hair already, I probably would have because of <laughs> that. So our whole approach is really, if I had to distill it down to one thing, it's really focused. It's focusing on one thing and doing extremely, extremely well. And we leverage paid traffic. So we don't, we don't get people. And this is, this is where uh, some people disagree with me. And I think they're crazy, to be honest, because I can't, I can't find an argument to the contrary that supports their perspective, which is most of our clients. Some people say like, you know, who have you worked with? I'm like, well, you probably wouldn't know most of them. So it doesn't even matter because most of our clients have little to no following. Some of them don't even have a website mm-hmm. and they just see our, our, our system, which we call a perfect client pipeline. It's just a very simple four-step model. Mm-hmm. And they're like, this makes sense because with paid traffic, the challenge, the, the challenge, if you don't understand how to, let's say, invest a dollar in Facebook ads and turn it into a profit is that you're forced to do everything else we just talked about. Mm. You know, if you've got, if you have a hundred followers on Instagram, there is no way on earth you're turning that into a viable business in the near future. Like Mm -hmm. it is never going to happen. Maybe in three, five years. Sure. But in the near term, not going to happen. So our whole approach is, okay, if you're relatively new, or if you've done a bunch of stuff that hasn't, you haven't, hasn't worked. The reality you have to understand is that all of us are working against an algorithm that favors pay to play. It's an algorithm that also favors people who already have influence. So if you have a million followers on Instagram, by all means, double down on that. If you have a hundred, not the best use of your time. Yeah. So for us, we're like, okay, why don't we show you a very simple system where you can, again, I talked about this earlier, like if you write an ad, a message, and again, in our case, when I say an ad, it's not like 10% discount this week, come into the, like, it's, it's a story, it's content, it's helpful. Mm-hmm. It's written in a way that moves people to action. We put it up on Facebook from that ad. We invite them to a masterclass or a webinar Mm -hmm. really in our worlds. The webinar is the only piece of content you need to build a seven figure business because we've done it. We've seen our clients do it as well. Mm -hmm. From that webinar, we invite people to fill out an application to speak with you, right? So that's the four step process called the perfect client pipeline. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about this is that you can like, people have no clue who we are for the most part. There's 3 billion people on Facebook and Instagram. So when you, when you don't, when you post something on, on Facebook, Facebook has shown us statistically that less than 2% of our followers are going to see it. Yep. So how are you supposed to like, what are you supposed to do with that? Mm-hmm. So Facebook has told us like blatantly, like, Hey, if you want more people to see it, you have to pay. You pay 20 bucks. We'll show it to this many people. You pay 200. We'll show it to more people. You pay 2000. We'll show it to ancient more people. And the goal is being able to understand how to turn that investment into a profit. Mm-hmm. And that's what we help our clients do every single day. So most of our clients come in, they have no following, they have no social platform. And we're like, great, you do have an expertise that can help someone with a specific issue. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Let's do this. You know, they build up their pipeline, takes, you know, a couple of weeks. Yeah. When they hit go on their Facebook ads, they could have clients by tomorrow. And 
there are many ways to scale a mountain, but there's only one way that's the fastest. And our approach is let's get there faster, let's get there smarter, let's put in the work to build the machine up front mm -hmm. and let the machine do the heavy lifting forever. And then down the road, when you have more free time in your life again and more space to think and your bandwidth, mm -hmm. then if you want to start doing more content, great. Because you have this foundation that's doing most of the work and bringing clients and revenue in, 90% of it is automated. You basically would take a call with a prospective client and you can enroll them. Eventually you have other people do that for you. Mm -hmm. But that's the system we teach, right? So it's about really mastering a couple basic things and doing them very, very well as opposed to this and this and this and this and this and this. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's our whole approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's such a strategic approach where you're not on this content creation hamster wheel, just like pumping out stuff like over and over and over. And instead it's like create really good strategic content, put money behind it. So more people see it. And then you're leading them into, in your case, the webinar, which is the relationship builder. Mm -hmm. um, on that note specifically, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. I feel like maybe webinars are being less attended live. Like maybe five years ago, I was actually like sitting on a one hour webinar learning from someone, but I feel like from what I've heard and just in my own experience, like a lot of people, they just don't have the bandwidth or they don't want the live training. How do you encourage those people who are signing up for the webinar to actually attend because there's such a high just ghosting rate, right? And I yeah. know it's a conversation I've been having with a lot of people. Like, how do you get them to actually show up, pay attention and like really learn from the professional that could help them? It's a good question. The, the reality is that we don't do live webinars because live webinars have a, an abysmal show up rate. Okay, okay. <laughs> so we're talking about like a webinar you record once, and then it runs 24 seven on your behalf. Yeah. Yeah. And because the thing is like people, if Netflix is a good example, people love speed and convenience. Mm -hmm. We have a webinar uh, Thursday night at eight o'clock and it's a Monday. Like, dude, listen, like this has to be the best thing since Justin Bieber, if I'm in attendance, right? People want instantaneous. They want now. So in our case, it's the opt-in and on the next page, they watch the training. And we know that not everyone's going to watch the training. So obviously there's a follow-up sequence with the replay, et cetera, but live webinars, like it is a tremendous amount of energy and effort to get people to show up to anything at any time, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's free. Absolutely. And even with that said, like another thing that people bring up sometimes is like, oh, like people don't have attention spans anymore. They want, they don't have time for this stuff. And I'm like, I agree, but we always have time for what's important to us. Always. So if your business is on the verge of going out of business and this piece of content could potentially save it, you'll put the time aside. I just watched an hour and a half of Boba, Boba Fett last night on Disney Plus with my kids. I had an hour and a half, right? I could have watched the webinar for an hour. Yep. And in things that I really, really enjoy and want help on, I will invest the time to learn that stuff. And so if someone says, I don't have the time to watch it, I'm like, well, that's great. It just tells me that you're not interested in improving whatever the situation is. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of the pipeline. One of the biggest challenges that we see is for those who do have websites, they'll come in and, I'll, you know, we don't do website design and stuff, but like right now we'll say, well, how do you get clients? Well, like most of it's word of mouth. Sometimes people come to my website somehow and they book a call. I'm like, sorry, they can book a call directly from your website. Like, how does that work? Mm -hmm. So there's like a book a call button on the page. A lot of people have that, but the challenge that a lot of our clients have that have been around for a while that have you know had some traction is they get a lot of crappy leads. They get people on the phone with them who are wasting their time, but have no context of how they do what they do. So the webinar really is like, it's a gatekeeper, mm -hmm. a value adder and a filtering tool mm -hmm. so that only the right people take the next step. So as an example, one of our mastermind clients is a naturopath. He's, he's got his physical practice and his virtual practice. And he set the goal of completely moving out of his uh, physical practice by uh, this May. So he was telling me yesterday, he's like, um, I'm, I'm still getting people booking calls from my website for the brick and mortar. 
And I said, just to be clear, you don't want to work with people in the brick and mortar, in, in brick and mortar anymore, right? Mm-hmm. He's like, correct. I said, so here's what you're going to do when we get off the call. You're going to change that button to the, that button is now going to direct to your webinar. Yes. They're going to watch the webinar. And if they still want to take the next step, then they can book a call with you and talk about your virtual program, not coming into the practice. Mm-hmm. I'm like, cool, simple, right? So yeah, so that's um, to, yeah, again, like an elongated answer for your question around webinars, but yep, yeah, I love that. Important. Really good tips. I'm curious too, in growing healthpreneur, like aside from Facebook ads and doing uh, webinars, is there anything else in the marketing space that's been working really, really well for you in either growing your audience or deepening relationships with potential clients? Like anything that's top of mind that you're like, yeah, keep your eye on this, or uh, this is working really well for us. Yeah. I mean, all, in all honesty, about 90% of our business comes from paid traffic, which mm-hmm. is I'm fine with. You Just know, one Facebook of the goals. or do you go off Facebook as well? We have, we're going to be opening up YouTube. We've done some stuff on YouTube ads. We just didn't have the right person running that. So we kind of put on the back burner for a bit. Yeah. Uh, I think YouTube ads, especially for health professionals helping the general public is a massive opportunity. So we do have a couple of clients that we help with on the YouTube side, but for the most part for us, it's been Facebook. Um, we did not have Instagram, YouTube, a podcast, which is simply the audios from my YouTube videos yeah. or anything for three years. All we did was our perfect client pipeline. And then I was like, okay, like uh, I'm ready to get back into the content game and, and share some stuff. So our YouTube channel has 2,600 people and it's been about a year and a half, right? And I'm like, I don't care. Like that for me, it's, I'm building this for 10 years down the road. So there's no like magic sauce there. It's just, I, I know that by putting out great content consistently, yeah. eventually I will win mm-hmm. in the sense of helping more people. But other than that, I'll be honest, like it took us three years to grow our Instagram following beyond 10 to 10,000 people. Um, we started using TikTok about a year ago. It took us two and a half months. That's really the only social platform right now where you can grow pretty quickly organically. It's, it'll obviously change as your advertising platform kicks in. Mm-hmm. But on Instagram, like in all honesty, I'm always looking at how can we multiply quickly and it's paid. So even on Instagram, we work with a growth company that we pay a good amount of money on a monthly basis to essentially have paid shout outs. Because we know like organically, like no one's going to, it's going to grow at like 50 people a week or whatever. Yeah. But we can grow by 25,000 people or 100,000 people a month legitimately Mm -hmm. just by paying. Obviously, in a way, we're not talking about black black hat stuff. Like, there's legitimate ways to do this. Yes. And when you see a lot of these companies, or not necessarily like the influencers themselves, but a lot of brands just go from like I have a, f- a friend of mine who was the co-founder of BioTrust Nutrition. When he started Instagram, he went from zero to more than a million followers in 60 days. What? <laughs> yeah, and he did that by paying for it. Right. So he said, listen, I want to impact as many people as possible. Who do I have to connect with? Who can do this legitimately? I will pay them. Let's just grow this puppy. Yeah. And that's, again, that's a mindset. That's, that's a a decision we have to make if we want to, for me, I'm like, does it make sense? Like how much money do we make per follower? Okay, cool. If we added 10,000, does do the numbers make sense? I would much rather pay and play that game than take forever organically to to somehow, you know, grow it. Mm -hmm. So there's no like secret sauce necessarily that's working now. Again, it's it's all about like messaging that connects with your audience. It's about you being you, Mm -hmm. being authentic, sharing your true voice and making the decision to say like, okay, I could pay for this, even if it's organic or I could run ads or I could do neither one and just being okay with the consequences of both those decisions and just really figuring out what's going to work best for you. So that's, I mean, for us, really, it's been the pipeline is our foundation ads, you know, for the kind of the immediate income, but the long-term play for us is content. We know that for sure. And it's really for us, even building out an outbound sales team, Mm -hmm. but doing so in a way that is not salesy, it's actually hyper-personalized and super value adding. That's something that we're Mm -hmm. focused on this year because, um, we, you know, we realize like at some level, it's one thing to run ads when it's just you. But when you have a large team and payroll, yeah, 
um, if anything ever happens to your ad account, even if it's shut down and comes back up, you know, that's, you know, like you start, you start diversifying your traffic sources a bit more. So, yeah. 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 I love it. I love how what you've shared today is really that you can start simply with like the simple pipeline and then down the line is when you can start to add on those extra layers, those extra line of defense, but you don't have to jump into your online business and do it all at once. You don't have to spread yourself so thin, focus on what works, make sure that's a well-oiled machine and then start considering, okay, what's the next logical uh, step. What's the next layer? What's the next layer? So it kind of like allows us all to breathe a sigh of relief that we don't have to be showing up in all of the places. And you've shared some really, I'd say fundamental, um, just like strategies and tools for building a successful business. So, uh, thank you so much for everything that you have shared today. And I mean, I feel like if anyone wants to learn more, I've already seen you have epic content all over the YouTube channel, on the podcast as well. Uh, but where are the best places for people to find out more, to learn more about what you guys are up to at Healthpreneur and to tune into your content? Yeah, thank you so much, Kelsey. Really, I mean, I think the two best places are Instagram. So I'm at Healthpreneur. And then the same uh, at Healthpreneur on YouTube, if you want to, like I've got hundreds of videos, like all of my best stuff. I don't hold anything back. It's like, yeah. everything's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So those would be the two places. And from there, you know, you can just drop me a, a message on, on IG. I'm okay. usually in the DMs. So yeah. Well, we're going to dive into all of your content. I'll link it all in the show notes and yeah, I'd highly encourage people go learn from your expertise. You've been in this online space much longer than so many people. So I know that you've learned a lot of lessons and just have a lot of value to share along the way. So thank you so, much, so much, Yuri, for being on the podcast. We really appreciate your time and wish you all of the best. Thanks so much, Kelsey.